All right, this is a, uh, another lecture on Texas history. Uh, this is Nathan Giesenschlag, and today I'd like to wrap up a little bit and make a few more remarks about population in Texas, and uh, more particularly also, and then we're going to switch into uh, some more geography, in this case uh, meteorological or weather geography, weather history uh, of Texas, uh, and talking about the uh, stories and events that have happened in the past at Texas. Uh, so all that to say is, is that before we get to the weather, um, Let's go ahead and discuss uh, some th a few more aspects of population. Not many, more probably no more than about four or five minutes worth. Uh, obviously, in the last lecture, I started talking about population, about changes in Texas going from a, uh, a predominantly Anglo state, or actually first uh, indigenous, uh, then Spanish uh, or Hispanic, and then later after uh, the influx of Anglos in the 19th century, a predominantly Anglo state, uh, up until the very recent times. And uh, of course, your switches uh, have taken place demographically. Texas has become quite diverse uh, in many different ways. Uh, but in addition to those uh, facets there, also touched on the fact that uh, for some of you watching this, for you, uh, your family moved to Texas one way or the other, whether it was from outside of Texas, outside of the United States, uh, to Texas in the last 20 years or in your lifetime, uh, or say it a little differently, some of you moved to Texas from other American states. You may have moved here from California because of dreams and hopes. Others might have moved from Ohio or New York State or some uh, northern climate where that's what we might call the Rust Belt or just things, uh, the opportunity was too great, the job was too great to pass up in Texas. And so uh, Texas is made habitable. Uh, but most of you watching this are going to come from, as I said last time, come from the cities. And uh, really, of course, I think it's about 80 90, 80 percent of Texas. And it is, as, uh, as I've said in the past, it just basically depends on how you uh, define your uh, term city. But basically, roughly about 80 percent of Texans live within the major metropolitan areas of Texas, especially the triangle of San Antonio, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth and Austin. Uh, and most of uh, you who are watching this would feel, uh, come from that. Some of you might come from El Paso. Others might come from the valley, a uh, deep valley, what I mean by Browns. Ville, Harlingen, uh, McAllen, maybe one or two from uh, Mac uh, Corpus Christi or the Golden Triangle of Beaumont Orange and Port Arthur. All that to say, though, is, is that most of you come from the city. But that's worth noting, too, is, is that obviously people have moved from the country to the city. Uh, the uh, Great Depression and the World War really accelerated that. Uh, the Great Depression drove many old farmers uh, off the land and drove them uh, sometimes to California. Oftentimes, they sent them all the way to, uh, to Houston to work in the ship channel and the shipyards and such. So all that to say is, is that Texas has changed and people have moved in the last hundred years, certainly from the country to the city. Uh, but particularly with regard to the story of Texas, one of the things you need to make note of and be aware of is it ju isn't just that it's just a country to the city sort of story, but there are parts of Texas that are frankly depopulating uh, and have been depopulating for 60 or so years. Uh, at least uh, at least since the 1950s or so, but arguably before that in the 1930s and 40s. So uh, the part of Texas we're talking about here, and uh, you occasionally have students who come from West Texas. Uh, those of you who travel to West Texas may have noticed there's it's a lot of open space in a modern sense, a lot of windmills, uh, and, and seemingly not much of anything else. Uh, but uh, th there are these old towns, uh, little uh, villages almost, uh, that are seemingly drying up and, and getting ready to blow away like a tumbleweed in West Texas. Uh, obviously, in West Texas, you still have a lot of ranches, you still have a lot of cattle, you still have a lot of feedlots, especially into the panhandle. But the territory around uh, out west of Fort Worth, west of I-35, uh, north and east and south of, say, Abilene or San Angelo, uh, what oftentimes has been called the big country, certainly south of uh, Vernon and Quanah and uh, Childress and uh, Wichita Falls on the Red River, up that part of the world, everything south of there. Uh, represented by cities such as Throckmorton or uh, Jacksboro or Archer City come to mind, uh, maybe Rising Star out around uh, Abilene. All that to say is these little old communities that out in the middle of nowhere in, uh, in central west Texas, uh, west of I-35, uh, the big country, they are what you could call a depopulator. And they're emptying out, and they have been for some time. And many of the people, some of you may be watching this, may come from that area, and you could say, yeah, the people left behind are just uh, the old. And I know I touched on that in the last class. Uh, but whereas uh, East Texas, which is still have a lot of rural aspects and small town aspects to it, 
Uh, they're kind of holding their own. Uh, some might be some of these little counties in East Texas might be growing. Others uh, just plateaued and, and kind of stable. Uh, you don't see that in West Texas unless there is a, say, a major oil boom uh, in the Permian Basin out around Midland and Odessa, in which some of you probably have family members who decamped to uh, Midland and Odessa in the mid-2000s. And at the time of this recording, which is in the fall of 2020, late August to be specific, uh, with the collapse of the oil industry right now, which is a boom and bust cycle anyways, made worse by the COVID business, the, the virus those little communities, those little West Texas towns around Sweetwater and, and so on, uh, you know, out there in Big Spring, that territory through there, they've, uh, they've gone up, they've come down and seemingly are on the back hillside once more. Uh, but uh, a lot of folks have moved away and a lot of folks aren't, and folks aren't going back, basically. Uh, you have to like to live in West Texas, especially a part that doesn't have beautiful and majestic mountains, perhaps like Alpine. Maybe a few of you have friends that live out in the Sol Ross, uh, go to, excuse me, go to school at Sol Ross State University in Alpine in West Texas. Uh, but you gotta, uh, but even there you gotta love it because it is very isolated uh, and very alone. And you can f be uh, engulfed by uh, the great expanse. So, but all that to say, though, is we're going to change our uh, focus now, and we're going to change it to weather, Texas weather. Uh, Texas weather is, uh, many of you have experienced in your own lifetime, especially if you're from the Houston, Galveston, Beaumont region, uh, it is, or even down around Corpus Christi, it can be quite violent and quite uh, noteworthy and, and something you'll never forget. When we talk about Texas weather, you can, because of the state of Texas, where it sits geographically, because of what it is uh, and where it is, uh, and Texas can uh, have uh, extremes on all uh, fronts. You can have extreme water, you can have extreme drought, you can have extreme uh, uh, wind. Uh, you get it all, uh, particularly in Texas. Uh, you get tornadoes, of course. Uh, Texas is said to be Tornado Alley, but in the last, uh, it's, that's probably a little bit overdone. We'll talk more about tornadoes in a bit. But uh, all that to say is you get pretty much every type of weather you can imagine uh, here in Texas, uh, from the cold to the extremes, uh, extreme heat to extreme cold even. So as we go on, uh, let's go ahead and start talking about, I guess, uh, just some basic uh, things such as uh, extreme weather in Texas history, weather events in Texas history, and then we'll go to disasters, uh, some of them uh, man-made, some of them not. So uh, when we talk about extreme weather in Texas history, I, let's go ahead and uh, have a few statistics for your notes. So if you want to say that what was the coldest uh, days in the history of Texas, uh, frankly, uh, you really a couple of years worth noting, or at least uh, I'll give you the date, uh, the dates and the, uh, the temperature. Coldest uh, ever recorded in Texas happened twice in the uh, late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, the, uh, the thermometer dropped to minus 23 at Seminole and Tulia uh, up in the Panhandle in the big country region up there close to the Red River. Negative 23 was the lowest temperature. But the, uh, at Seminole in 1899, that is, uh, is worth noting as well. 1899 is a rather interesting year. Uh, in a span of about two or three years, you seemingly had a laundry list of major events, uh, major weather uh, phenomena take place in Texas. 1899, worth remembering, is the coldest winter in the history of Texas that was recorded. It's probably likely you had a colder winter in the, uh, in the distant past before the Spanish started taking recordings uh, in the 1700s. Uh, it's very possible during the Little Ice Age you had some very cold years. Uh, it may be possible even that 18, uh, what was it, 16, which was seemingly the year without a summer, uh, you might have even had a, that might have been considered a cold year. Uh, but the fact of the matter was, before, since we've been taking regular recordings, uh, 1899 is the one that holds the record. Uh, the average temperature, meaning high, low, uh, high temperature, low temperature during the day, uh, the temperature overall in the state of Texas averaged together, brought together uh, the winter of 1899, which would have been into the, uh, well, the, the, the basic, it would have been 1899 in the sense like uh, February and January 99. Uh, you had some horribly low temperatures, but anyways, uh, the average temperature for that winter was uh, 41.3 degrees, which is extraordinarily low. 
So uh, why is it? Uh, why was that so cold? Uh, probably some of it has to do with less of a heat island effect. Uh, there is something to the heat island idea uh, that the larger a city gets, the more with more concrete, more reflective glass, uh, more asphalt, uh, and so forth. Uh, a city gets hotter and hotter, and just you pack everybody together. I think there's something to that. But, you know, frankly, you can also chalk that up a little bit to uh, uh, climate change probably at this point. I, I, I used to discount it, but the more I've thought about it and the more I've uh, looked at statistics and such, I think there's something to that. Uh, and so just maybe larger population, all that factor in, and maybe just simply put uh, high, uh, larger ice shelf uh, at that time period, on and on I can go. Maybe sunspot activity was, uh, was very low, and so in a sense the sun was cooler uh, overall, but all that to say is that was a very, very uh, cold year. You can anecdotally show it uh, in several ways. In 1899, uh, you actually had, and this is worth noting, especially for you Houston Galveston kids uh, who are watching this, uh, in, on Galveston Bay, you had ice flows on Galveston Bay. And I don't want to make it sound like this was uh, ice land in, in the sense that you had ice, it was, you know, uh, the Galveston Bay was choked with ice. That's not what I mean, but you had ice floating, uh, chunks of ice, not gigantic, but chunks of ice floating on Galveston Bay in the winter of 1899 at times. That was, that's unheard of. Uh, certainly today, uh, we're doing good to have, be able to turn on the heater in South Texas or South Central Texas once or twice a uh, winter, but back then that was a bad year. But even more dramatically, going south by about 180 miles, uh, many of you are familiar with Rockport, Aransas Pass, and Corpus Christi. Uh, maybe if you just went down there to go fishing and uh, vacation and, and what have you, uh, but there was even ice trying to form on Aransas Bay. Uh, there was a, it was observed in Rockport in 1899 in the same winter, and that's 200, 180 miles south of Galveston Bay on the coast. So uh, that should tell you how cold that winter was. Uh, there's lore out of my family, and if you dig around in your own family, I bet you would find something uh, to that effect saying that my uh, great-grandfather, in my case, my uh, grand, no, my great-grandfather, you're probably greater great-great-grandparents, uh, skated on some ponds if they lived in Texas in that time period because uh, that was one of the things that was said about my uh, grandfather's uh, generation, uh, particularly my grandfather was born in 1901. And the Giesenschlags are elongated and we, we have kids, we just do it late in life as it turns out. But uh, all that to say is, is that some of his brothers in 1899, my grandfather's brothers, went skating on ponds uh, because they could. Now, I don't want to make it sound like it was a gigantic uh, Toledo Bend Reservoir because all those tanks back then were uh, either hand-dug or more likely mule-dug tanks, so they wouldn't have been all that deep. I uh, didn't have any mechanization back then to speak of around this part of Texas. But that's all to say is, is that it was a cold, cold winter, and uh, that's uh, one little note right there. So, I mean, you can have snow file uh, up in the panhandle, especially. It seems like 24 inches in, in one year. Uh, for those of you kids from the San Antonio area, if you've got grandparents who are living, uh, maybe if your parents are old enough, uh, they'd remember this too. It's talking about snowfall, freak uh, events in Texas history. San Antonio in 1985 got smacked with 13 inches of snow. Uh, it, was, it just sh it paralyzed the city. But you also remember too, especially from those of you who are in Dallas or San Antonio, uh, I joke about it uh, a little bit tongue-in-cheek because I've lived in both cities for a, a little bit of my earlier life. But when you talk about San Antonio and Dallas, the fact is it seems like the in, in you know when you hear the uh, weather report of snow and sleet and, and ice, uh, Texans freak out. And normally what that means for some Texans it is, is that you shift into four-wheel drive and speed up. Uh, drivers in San Antonio, in my opinion, this is my opinion, this is not official, but sometimes the San Antonio drivers are pretty bad to begin with. It's sometimes true in Dallas, it seemed like as well, when I rode a motorcycle. But the fact was is that uh, you throw in ice and those elevated uh, overpasses, high fives, and, uh, high fives and crossovers like in downtown or up around uh, the mix, up around uh, LBJ and 75 in Dallas particularly or some of the stuff in, uh, in San Antonio down around the, the uh, inner city, meaning downtown San Antonio. The fact of the matter is, is that if you get a little snow, it's just going to paralyze the city. So 13 inches in San Antonio was uh, one of those freak events just for a, a moment of our time. Uh, but Texas, when we talk about weather, of course, you can have cold, but we're more likely to be attuned uh, to the issue of extreme heat and the highest heat that we've ever had 
to my knowledge uh, and what I've recorded is uh, to a couple times uh, out on that uh, searing uh, territory, uh, sometimes out in West Texas, sometimes up in the uh, out uh, away from the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we've had 120 degrees on a couple of occasions, once in 1994 and the other in 1936. Uh, so you can have extreme heat, but really when we talk about heat, uh, that allows me to jump into the next aspect of Texas uh, weather, uh, and that is the issue of drought, the issue of lack of rain. Uh, Texas is prone to drought. Uh, that is certainly true. I think you need to mark that down, uh, that Texas, every generation, and when I use the term generation, uh, and I try to do it kind of as has been done over the years, when I use the term gener generation, I generally mean about a 20 to 30 year period, uh, somewhere uh, a generation. So the idea of a generation would be uh, a man being born and then he has his uh, first set of kids or first children or his family uh, somewhere around the age of 25 or 30. Now, I understand as we get older, and if you can read statistics, kind of talked about the demographics in the last lecture, but the fact of the matter is Texans and just in general Americans and just in general the uh, uh, developed world, uh, first world, people wait longer before they have kids and they have less kids. So for some of you, the idea of you having a child at age 23 or 24, 25, like your grandparents or great-grandparents would, uh, is uh, something that uh, either horrifies you, scares you, or just something you would you just dismiss out of hand. Uh, maybe many of you won't have your first child uh, till you're 30 or 35, which is quite common today. But for me, when I talk about uh, the idea of uh, having a, a generation as a time period, I think of 25 to 30 years. So uh, anyways, uh, so you have a generation of, of talking about, uh, about once every generation, you're going to have some sort of drought in Texas. Um, the thing, too, also to remember is, is that uh, the further west uh, you get in Texas, the more prone to drought you're going to be. I'll talk more about that statistically in a minute. Uh, so the further west you get in Texas, uh, the more prone to drought you're going to be. Uh, in addition to that, every so often, uh, so often defined as maybe once every 50 years, sometimes once every 100 years, you're going to have a year or a series of years that are just nor uh, abnormally dry to the point where sometimes they're so bad you look around and you say, oh my gosh, I can't believe we survived that. And think about it, it, it most of you again, and I, perhaps I'm beating the proverbial dead horse now, but most of you of course come from cities and so it, it would affect you, a drought would, but you would notice it in the form of, my gosh, it's hot, and man, I've got to water my yard. Uh, but if you think about it from an agricultural society and a, a or the agricultural industry in a modern sense, but a, a society that was based on the land rather than in the city, uh, this would be much more pronounced and much more traumatic. You might even see uh, in some areas and back in the past, you would see perhaps famine or at least shortages of food uh, and hardship because of the drought. Uh, to give you an a couple of examples, and if you're wondering, do I make a big deal of dates? Uh, in Texas history, perhaps more than I do in U.S. history, that's true. Uh, but when we talk about droughts in Texas, uh, obviously uh, most of you who are watching this should be able to remember, even if it's kind of a fuzzy memory as a child, the year 2011. 2011 was one of the worst single-year droughts in the history of Texas. Uh, it just simply would not rain, it seemed like. Uh, here, and it, the thing was, it wasn't just one locality that was a bad drought. Uh, 2011 was all over central uh, West Texas, central Texas, even East Texas, which has an abundant rainfall normally. Uh, East Texas was dry too. Uh, so 2011 was a bad drought, one of the worst in our history. Uh, 1925, uh, using uh, single years uh, as examples, 25 was bad, uh, particularly in central Texas and so on. Uh, but the year I'd really have you remember was 1917. 1917 at the outbreak of World War I, as it turned out in Texas, uh, was a horrible, horrible drought. It was the worst uh, recorded as far as just lack of rain, and it just wouldn't rain. 1918 wasn't much better, but it was better. It did have more rain, but 1917 kind of rings the bell. And you'll get anecdotal stories uh, out of old newspapers, uh, out of history books, out of oral histories, family lore about, uh, for example, uh, we planted corn and we were making a good crop and then it, we just had a little bit of rain in the springtime, but enough to bring it up and we looked like we were going to do well. And then all of a sudden in April, the winds came up. And we're not talking about a gentle breeze. We're talking about a hard, hot breeze. Now, again, if you come from the city, it's going to, and I sound like a, a farm boy trying to educate, uh, you know, I don't mean to talk down and I'm not trying to be condescending or anything, uh, 
But I will say this is that uh, you can feel that hot breeze, say coming out of uh, uh, Minute Maid Park when you could go to a football game, it's me a baseball game, uh, or Kyle Field and you come out of the stadium, particularly some, or just come out of a building and you come out and you hit this blast furnace wind around your face. You up in Dallas, you know what I'm talking about, San Antonio, of course, as well. That's what I'm talking about. A 15, 20 mile an hour wind that just feels like a blast furnace and it cooks you. But luckily for us, we can go inside and get out of the air, get into the air conditioning and get out of the wind. But in 1917, uh, it tormented the people and it burned up all the crops, it seemed like. Now, that's the worst year. But drought in Texas also can take the form of not just a bad year, but a series of years. Uh, we think uh, ballyhooed, of course, because of our uh, our focus on sometimes and we talk about in a history, especially in a high school or a community college survey like this is, you talk about history and the great sweeps and so forth, especially national history, if it's say U.S. history one, two as a junior in high school or whenever you exactly took it. You talk about, say, the great droughts in, in, in the United States and you think, ah, the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. That was true for East uh, the eastern part of the uh, Texas panhandle around Pampa, uh, perhaps uh, Hereford or something like that. But the fact of the matter is, is that Texas was not really hurt by the, the Dust Bowl. The idea of a Dust Bowl in Texas just really isn't true historically. It's kind of a myth. Uh, the Dust Bowl did exist, but existed up on the plains, such as Oklahoma and Kansas and, and so on. That's where the Dust Bowl was, uh, far more than it was in our part of Texas. But Texas has had elongated droughts. Uh, I'll give you two, uh, maybe three, if I, if I can remember the date on the third one. Uh, but anyways, all that to say is that Texas from time to time, seemingly about once a century, is going to have a bad set of drought years where it just is dry and it won't rain, or it seemingly won't ever rain. And in fact, uh, there was a book uh, in, in Texas that was written in the early 1960s called The Time It Wouldn't Rain, uh, or When It Wouldn't Rain. Anyways, all that to say, though, is the 1950s, from about 1951, early 52, until about 1957 when it started to rain, and when it rained, it rained, and it rained, and like, uh, to use an earthy sort of saying, it rained like a cow peeing on a flat rock. But the fact of the matter is, is that uh, it was wet in 1957. But to get to 1957, you had to cross through about a five-year period where it seemed like it never did rain. Uh, and a lot of those, uh, and I referenced this a minute ago, a lot of those hand-dug tanks uh, just didn't make it. They dried up, and a lot of men went out of business in the 1950s. A lot of cattlemen, uh, small-timers, of course, not the big boys. Uh, but even they suffered, too, in the sense that your business was, uh, was wrecked. Uh, you had to sell cattle that you couldn't keep. You couldn't feed them in the wintertime. You could, there was not enough grass in the springtime because it, you didn't have a spring. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, we think of the great blue bonnets out around Brenham and maybe uh, Hempstead or something like that, uh, perhaps up all, around Ennis up in the Dallas area. You think of the blue bonnets in the springtime, but when you have droughts like the 1950s, you'd, and this was before Lady Bird Johnson was vi uh, first lady and the, the big planting of blue bonnets in Texas took place, or Indian paintbrushes as well, you just didn't have springs. Uh, it, you just, it was just dead. It was like the, the worst of winter that just carried on and seemingly wouldn't end. I'm not saying it never rained. I'm just saying it never rained enough. And so that was be one year. In the 1850s, almost 100 years before, you all had an equally bad series of droughts from about 1855 to 1859, right on the outset of the uh, Civil War. Uh, and it was also uh, disastrous for Texas agriculture and arguably might have helped push Texas because uh, it stirred the pot, made people nervous and jumpy. It, it exacerbated an already tense situation and maybe helped push Texas uh, into the arms of the Confederacy and secession in 1860. I, I, don't put, I don't put a whole lot of weight on that. I think Texas was already going that route, but it certainly didn't help the psyche of many Texans in the 1850s when they're uh, watching basically their cattle starve or die. And then in the 18, uh, excuse me, about 1780 uh, to about 1800, maybe 1798, the Spanish recorded a series of dry, if not disastrous years uh, that seemed like a generation of drought. And that's kind of the gold standard for droughts in Texas. So uh, lack of rain is not uncommon in Texas. Uh, but so if that talk, we talk about a lack of rain, let's switch now to rain. Let's talk about rainfall in Texas. So when we talk about rainfall, 
Uh, first of all, when you start in East Texas over around the Sabine River, over around Orange and Port Arthur and that territory through there, that's the wettest part of the state. And you can put this in your notes. You're going to average about 60 to 62 inches of rain a year. It is wet. And if you never, if you uh, live over there, you know it is, you feel it, and it rains seemingly all the time. Uh, that's true throughout East Texas, and on top of that, not only is it wet, but it's humid, and it's just as different from, of course, being in Austin or certainly out in West Texas. But if we traveled westward, and I'm going from right, meaning the, uh, the East Texas line, East Texas meaning Louisiana-Texas line going uh, westward, if we travel westward across Texas, for, and write this statistic down, write this uh, theory down, for every 15 miles west you travel, for every 15 miles west you travel in Texas, uh, you can subtract, you can subtract an uh, inch of rain off of the annual rainfall total. So that when you start just traveling westward across Texas, and it's not a completely straight line, but it kind of uh, zigs and zags, but over the main, it's straight enough. But every 15 miles west you go, less rain you get by an inch. And so by the time you get to where we are at Blinn College uh, in Bryan College, Bryan College Station, you're looking at right at about 40 to 41 inches of rain a year. Now, if you go out toward, uh, say, uh, Giddings, uh, which is about 40 miles or so uh, east, it's going to be west of here, you're looking at 38 inches of rain a year, somewhere in that neighborhood. You get out around Austin, it's down around 35 or so. In San Antonio, about 33 to 35 as well, um, really about 35 because uh, Austin and San Antonio, they aren't quite straight in the line, but it's good enough. About 34, 35 in San Antonio. Corpus Christi uh, in, and uh, Rockport on the coast, uh, a little higher because of the influences of the coast. Uh, but still, it's not like Beaumont and Port Arthur. And then, of course, by the time you get out to El Paso in far west Texas, uh, you're looking at about 5 or 7 inches of rain a year. Point is this, is the further west you go, the less rain you get. And so that is worth noting uh, in many respects, uh, but I will say this, it also has a profound, of course, impact upon the uh, history of Texas. Uh, as you should remember, or just kind of intuit, I would say, Texas in its early days, uh, after the Spanish relinquished control of the Mexicans and the Mexicans invite the Anglos in, in the uh, first big wave of immigration, uh, Anglo immigration into Texas in the 1830s and 40s, and frankly continuing on after the revolution, uh, Texas uh, was obviously very agricultural, and uh, if you were to try to grow cotton or any uh, major either food stuff or more particularly cash crop in Texas uh, in the 1830s and 40s, uh, you were going to try to do it in the Brazos River Valley and elsewhere. But as time moves on, especially 1850, 1860 with the Civil War, that kind of stopped and stunted Texas for a little bit of time, but after the Civil War, you're going to have, especially in the 1870s and 80s, you're going to have a lot of small-time farmers moving out toward San Angelo, moving out toward Abilene, west of I-35, especially after the Comanches are, are, uh, are placed on, a reserv on the reservation system. These small-time farmers are going to try to grow cotton out west, and it looks like good land, but the climate was against them, and they last about a generation, maybe two, and then many of them fold and move on. So uh, what you'll see is, is that a lot of uh, hardcore farmers are going, because that's all they knew, they're going to try to farm in places that were just not uh, conducive to it. Uh, you'll even see uh, farming try to take place uh, on the sides of hills. Uh, for those of you who have uh, maybe from uh, the hill country of Texas, or you have, uh, say, ranch land, or maybe not ranch land, maybe ranch land, or maybe a hunting lease out there in West Texas, or I should say the hill country out around, maybe you got family members who go to Fredericksburg to go on wine tasting excursions or, uh, you know, antiquing or something like that. But the hill country, there was a whole lot of uh, failed, there are a whole lot, and if you look in the, the uh, legal and title territory, there are a whole lot of failed uh, of, uh, farms back in the 19th and uh, early 20th century out in that part of the world. So all that to say, though, is, is, is uh, one of the themes you'll see me develop more as the semester unwinds, or the, the eight weeks unwinds, is the idea of Texas being an agricultural state, especially in the 19th century, it being cotton.
and it has profound effects upon Texas, some of which I'll circle back to uh, climatologically in a second, as far in the form of disasters. So uh, rainfall is hit or miss, and it's rarely ever average. I think you also want to make note of that. You can talk about averages, but rarely is a year close to average. We don't have the, the kind of uniformity of rainfall that you see, say, in North Carolina or Virginia. Uh, if you've ever lived up that way and you have family up that way, uh, parts of Virginia have the exact same average of rainfall that we'd have here in Texas. But whereas we get it in big slugs in, say, the spring and very early summer, and then it dries off completely in July and August, like, we're, well, like what I'm recording this, and then it picks up somewhere in September normally, uh, and then it dries out a little bit in the, in the winter, uh, we get it in slugs. They get it over a, a general sweep of time. So uh, that's, uh, that's kind of a, a discussion about weather in the sense that weather, at least in far, as far as uh, seasonal rainfall and effects and so forth. But rainfall in Texas uh, obviously can have extremes just like the drought can. Uh, the year like 1917 was the bell ringer for Texas uh, that we know of. Uh, rainfall, the same sort of thing. But we may, uh, when we say this, many of you uh, who are watching this will have grown up with a name in your, no in your head. And the name will be the Harvey. You know what I'm saying when I say Harvey. I, every, you don't have to add hurricane, but that's obviously what Harvey was. But when you just say Harvey, uh, it, 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 so for many of you, or maybe for some of you, it will be the event, the weather event of your lifetime by which everything else is, especially similar sorts of events, whether it's rainfall or another hurricane, you'll say I, it was worse than Harvey, it was better than Harvey, I was less scared uh, than I was with Harvey. Uh, you're almost, and I don't mean, you got to be careful when you make this analogy, but I think it can work for a little, a little bit. You don't want to push it too far, of course. Uh, but uh, it's like being in combat, and there was, you were in a bad battle. And you'll, you will see soldiers say, especially I think of the Civil War with the Battle of Shiloh in Tennessee, a lot of soldiers would say, I was worse scared than I was at Shiloh. That was the standard by which everything else was measured. For some of you watching this, Harvey will be the standard by which you measure other things. And again, it's, uh, I think that's a fair assessment. For my father's generation, it was Carla, and I'll talk about her more in a second. But the fact of the matter remains, though, when we say uh, we talk about weather in Texas and Harvey particularly, uh, some of you watching this had your homes uh, basically flooded out a few years ago. Uh, in addition to that, not only did you have your homes flooded out, you had many families, your whole neighborhood perhaps. Uh, there was bad flooding, of course, uh, well-known and well-documented in Houston and greater Houston. Uh, and then also, of course, uh, it's it, because Houston is a media hub. And I don't mean this in some sort of conspiracy. It's just a big city. It's a large city. It's the largest city in Texas uh, and a, a major metropolitan area that just got slammed by uh, many, many inches of rain over the span of about three days or so. The fact was is that uh, Beaumont and Port Arthur got nearly as much rain over the same period of time, maybe in some places more rain than uh, Houston did, and didn't receive as much coverage. But at the same time, many, some of you watched uh, everything get flooded out. Maybe in the third time it was flooded out in four years. I don't know. All that to say, though, is, is that when you talk about Houston and Harvey, um, there was a lot of rain. But uh, those, are, those are those spectacular events, and uh, I'll say this anecdotally, uh, where I live in Snook, I got about, out of Harvey, I got about 20 inches of rain, but where I live, I didn't have to worry about flooding. And as my dad said once to my mother uh, 40, 50 years ago, right after they got married and they moved up here back to Snook, uh, their house sits on top of a hill and I'm sitting on the side of a hill. Uh, it, it would be like this. It, my mother, who was born in San Antonio, particularly the little bedroom community known as Kirby, grew up and went to Judson High School. Mama asked my dad, said, uh, Bill, do you think it's, uh, honey, uh, do you think it's going to flood and do we need to worry? And dad's <laughs> response was, if, if we get flooded on top of this hill, ain't nobody going to come save us. And that's true for where we are. And same for me. But Harvey did dump about 20 inches of rain. Uh, I saw water in lots of places I'd never seen it before. Uh, and the furies of one of those nights, uh, even here, uh, 100 miles inland, 125 miles inland, uh, was quite impressive and quite fearful. Uh, but some of you know exactly what I'm talking about with Harvey and rain because you saw it all yourself. But when you talk about great uh, rainfall in Texas, uh, in 24 hours, uh, you could say it like this, uh, the great rainfall in Texas was actually from another little storm, uh, don't remember the name of it, I don't even 
know that it had a name, but it was down at Alvin. Uh, for those of you from the Houston area, you know where Alvin is. It's kind of on the way to Galveston, kind of. Uh, but anyways, all that to say, they received in 24 uh, hours about 40 to 42 inches of rain. Let me see if I got this written down in front of me. Uh, rainfall at Alvin, yeah, it was 43 inches of rain in a 24-hour period. So that's a heck of a lot of rain. Uh, they got it bad. And then, of course, uh, the one that's also worth noting in an 18-hour period uh, because of a hurricane as well uh, is a little old community out in Williamson County. And I think you ought to write this name down. I've always thought it was interesting that uh, this little Blackland Prairie, uh, the town's name is Thrall, T-H-R-A-L-L, -L. Thrall, Texas. Thrall, Texas. Some of you have driven through Thrall on the way to Bryan College Station because you drove through Thrall on Highway 70, Federal Highway 79 coming out of Round Rock and Georgetown. You drive through Hutto and then you get to Thrall eventually. There's what Thorndale out there as well. But if you notice that land, it's all flat black land. And they had a whole bunch of cotton and it rained and, and rained and it rained. Um, so that uh, those two uh, events, uh, I'll talk more about the Thrall storm in, in its greater context in just a second. But the fact was those uh, Thrall had 36 inches of rain in 18 hours and the 24 in the first uh, uh, eight hours. So it, it just rained and it rained and just uh, went to pieces over top of it. But uh, rainfall can be pretty high in Texas. You can see it in Dallas. You can see there's lots of stories that we can go on and on about. So when we talk about uh, weather disasters in Texas, that obviously has got to bring me to hurricanes. And Texas, uh, and I'm not going to rehash Harvey. Some of you know it all too well, know it better than I do. Uh, I will say this, is that I do remember and quite, uh, recall quite vividly, and I guess for me, Harvey will be one of those events as well. But I do remember quite vividly our local weather guy uh, looked like somebody had walked on his grave, to use a phrase out of a movie, but it certainly looked like he'd seen something he didn't want to see. He looked like he'd supped with the devil uh, when he was talking about how bad it was going to be and the, the estimates of rainfall in the Houston area that he was talking about and for us was actually low, which is, uh, it, yeah, it was a heck of an event. But let's talk about hurricanes. Now, hurricanes have obviously hit the Texas coast uh, basically since the dawn of time and hurricanes started forming in the distant, distant past. So that's not unusual. Um, hurricanes, as we call them, as Harvey would be the name uh, that we have. Another name that's worth writing down in your notes is a, uh, another uh, name, Carla, C-A-R-L-A, -A, Hurricane Carla. She was a big monster and smacked uh, the Texas uh, coast pretty well. In fact, uh, 1961 is when Carla came ashore at Palacios on Matagorda Bay, basically, and uh, just smashed up uh, uh, good swaths of Texas, uh, the wind blew. Uh, at that point, uh, Carla had about 150 mile an hour winds, uh, a tick underneath it, uh, low barometric pressure, all those sorts of things like that. And it, it uh, Carla was a monster of a storm. For my dad's generation, dad was born in 44, 1944. For my dad's generation, their measuring stick is Carla. Everything was Carla, it was worse than Carla, less than Carla. But as we backtrack through history, uh, the highest wind gust in Texas ever recorded, at least as far as a hurricane was produced, was at, Cor at Aransas Pass uh, in 1970 with a hurricane named Celia. And, uh, but that was, uh, it was bad to corpus, but it was kind of a small hurricane. But anyways, uh, but let's backtrack to some really destructive ones uh, and talk about how weather, especially hurricanes, can affect the territory and really change history. Uh, some of it is obvious in the sense like you know it, uh, but let me give you some specific examples. Let's use 1921 as an example here, and let me go ahead and get that storm out of the way, and then I'll focus in uh, for the last few uh, minutes of lecture on two other hurricanes, uh, th actually probably about three other hurricanes. So the fact of the matter is in 1921, you had a hurricane, and I'm looking, if you're wondering why I'm looking off to my, le my left, your right, I'm looking at a map of Texas in my office where I'm recording this at. Uh, when we talk about uh, the hurricane in 1921, they didn't have any names in 1921 for hurricanes. They just call, if it was bad enough, you'd say the hurricane of 1921, the hurricane of 1938, or, the, or something like that. So anyways, no names for them back then, but the hurricane of 1921 was not exactly impressive. It was not a big hurricane in the sense like you say, oh, Carla was a, a super monster, a Katrina type size storm, etc. Another name that everybody will remember, like Louisiana especially. But the 1921 hurricane came ashore near Brownsville, down on the deep southern Texas coast. It was uh, big enough, but it, wasn't, it was not big by anybody's imagination. 
And then just because the way the high pressures and atmospherics and the prevailing winds all set up, uh, the hurricane went inland, uh, rained over, Gal- over Brownsville down in the valley, uh, dropped some rain there, and immediately swung northward. Passed over San Antonio, uh, literally right over top of the city. Uh, again, this is not a big hurricane, so it, it didn't rain at Uvalde, if you know where Uvalde is. And it didn't rain at Houston, which is east of San Antonio by about 200 miles. Didn't rain there. Heck, didn't even rain, to my knowledge, at Schulenburg, which is halfway between San Antonio and Houston. But in San Antonio, it rained a lot. It rained a massive amount. And so when we talk about San Antonio, one of the things worth noting is is that they get floods from time to time. Those of you from the San Antonio area, you know that. One of the great floods in San Antonio was caused by this hurricane in 1921. And uh, floods out downtown, it drops uh, many, about 12, 14 inches of rain overnight. Downtown, if you know downtown San Antonio, it's, it's, uh, it's a bit of a bowl. Uh, it's really actually more of a V-shaped bowl, uh, and all this water will run down into the downtown area. Killed, some, uh, killed a bunch of people downtown. Uh, I think a couple dozen, in fact. Uh, then particularly to talk about how it uh, you can change history uh, or change the, the lay of the land, literally, uh, it, it was this hurricane in 1921 that rolled northward uh, out of San Antonio and then just completely blew apart uh, in some sort of spectacular meteorological fashion. Uh, no satellites back then, no radars back then, so you don't know how it did it, but basically it just fell apart over top of Thrall, Texas and dropped those 36 inches of rain in 18 hours. From where I'm sitting and recording this in Snook, Texas, to Thrall, Texas is about, as the crow flies, is about 60 miles. And it didn't rain a drop here. It did not rain a drop here, yet it caused flooding on the Brazos River. Which is uh, is to say, uh, you have this uh, elongated, and you're going to hear me talk about this 1921 hurricane in several fashions when I talk about rivers uh, in Texas. So you'll see uh, this 1921 hurricane pop up because it caused flooding on the San Antonio River, and I'll talk about how it impacted San Antonio. In fact, also worth noting, this 1921 hurricane caused uh, flooding on the Brazos River. It's one of the great floods because it literally, in this case here, worth noting, I'll go and say it now, is the 1921 flood caused by this hurricane that did not rain where we are. Uh, It rained over top of the San Gabriel and Little Rivers, which are tributaries to the Brazos River. It literally caused a dust cloud or dust storm. Probably the storm is overblown on my part as a historian talking about it, but caused a dust cloud to roll up in the Brazos River bottom is this flood, these flood waters came roaring down the Little River and inundated the Brazos River flood plain. It caught a lot of people by surprise, killed some folks, uh, killed thousands of animals, and ruined uh, millions of dollars worth of crop. So anyways, that 1921 uh, is, all, is uh, called by many uh, Texans the dry flood of 1921 because it just didn't rain, and yet you had this flood coming out of nowhere seemingly like some sort of uh, uh, biblical event. Anyways, uh, so that was a bad uh, hurricane, just be, not because of its size or even because of its wind, but just because of the rain it possessed. But in addition to that, let's back up further in time. Let's talk about another hurricane that does, uh, two hurricanes that do damage and really affect the course of two cities. The first one is very famous, and you know it already. It's the deadliest natural disaster in the history of the United States. Deadlier than Katrina, which killed thousands of people in Louisiana. It's deadlier than uh, any of the other hurricanes we've had uh, that that are out there. It's the Galveston Hurricane of 1900, the Great Hurricane of 1900. And Texas, to be clear, it's not always true, but it's kind of a good proverb or a maxim to keep in the back of your mind. After about September 10th, 15th, uh, Texas, uh, uh, Texas doesn't have to worry about hurricanes nearly as much because you start seeing these cold fronts drop down, and those cold fronts act as a, a wall, a, a, a barrier from hurricanes coming off the Gulf to, uh, into Texas. But in early September 1900, a massive uh, hurricane essentially catches Galveston uh, by, uh, by uh, asleep, uh, in some cases literally asleep. But the story of the Galveston hurricane, some of you know it, uh, is, uh, is quite impressive and uh, quite tragic in many respects. As I said, it's the nat- deadliest natural disaster in the history of the United States. It killed at least 5,000 people, and I think it was probably closer to 7,000 to 8,000 Galvestonians over one night, basically. 
The Galveston hurricane in 1900 was uh, is a story of hubris, meaning uh, overweening pride, overweening confidence, uh, that nothing bad could happen. And it wasn't just a story of the a government failure, which it is partially, but it's also a story of uh, of a city, a great city that really uh, kind of thought it was invulnerable uh, to anything. You got to understand Galveston, and this is worth all. This is, of course, uh, you know, could be used on an exam or a quiz. But the fact of the matter is, Galveston in 1900 was the wealthiest city in the United States. Let's just go ahead and put that in your notes right now. Get an understanding of what Galveston was. Galveston in 1900 was the wealthiest city in the United States. Uh, per capita, more millionaires per capita than anywhere else. It was the banking hub of the southwestern United States. you got to remember, 1900, Arizona was nothing. It was just a territory. Nobody lived there except for a handful of people. Uh, so there was no Phoenix. There was no great Arizona uh, miracle in the desert. Uh, you have a lot of cotton that's going to be grown in Texas in 1900. And it's not just in the Brazos River Plains, uh, but you have a lot of cotton that's grown up through the Brazos River uh, bottom. Frankly, even on sides of hills and out around Thrall, as I mentioned a few years, mo moments ago, out around Waco and so forth. On and on I can go, and I probably will when I talk about the Brazos River. So a lot of that cotton is going to end up coming to Galveston, is going to be put on ships at Galveston. It's going to be sent to textile industries in New, in in New England. Uh, other parts of the United States, uh, England, particularly old England, I should, could say, uh, there in Manchester and, and what have you, the old textile looms there. In many ways, Texas is booming. At least uh, it's, it's growing. Uh, you haven't had the oil boom just yet, uh, but it is doing quite well. It's getting wealthier and, and on we can go, which is to say that Texas uh, is, uh, is got a good uh, financial district in Galveston. Lots of big banking houses, lots of wealthy families, uh, and Galveston's an island. Uh, most of you know that. Some of you spent time at Galveston uh, for uh, summer break or some sort of vacation with a family. Uh, for me, I, I could care. I'm not a big fan of Galveston. I'd much rather be at Rockport, Port Aransas, and Corpus Christi, but that's just me. But others, some of you watching this would say, I love Galveston with all the tar balls uh, floating in the water. Now, I think they're better about that now, but to me, the Galveston beach has never been all that pretty. But all that to say is, is that Galveston was a heck of a city. Uh, and compared to Houston, Houston was a dump. Uh, I, Houston was a uh, mudville. I mean, it, that's literally what Galveston called it, amongst other things. But Houston is nothing. I mean, it's, it's a city of several thousand or multiple thousands, but Galveston has got about 25,000 people living on that sandbar, uh, and most of, many of them are doing quite well, some of them spectacularly well. Uh, say a name like Moody would be an example. Uh, perhaps uh, Sealy, like this mattress you sleep on. That comes out of that Sealy family, and on and on I could go. Uh, Galveston was feeling good, and Galveston thought the, their oyster was just opening, to use an expression, the idea that it was just opening and there was the great pearl in the middle. Uh, it was sunlit uplands uh, from as far as the eye could see. Galveston was going to be the great city of Texas. I think you probably ought to write that in your notes. Uh, this is something I'll probably develop in the coming near-term lectures that are kind of modern history. But uh, we need to remember, as uh, Texas history students, that uh, they, meaning our ancestors, like we don't, they did not have foresight. They did not realize, oh my gosh, Texas is going to be a, a nation of 29, excuse me, a nation, huh? uh, but a state of 29 million individuals. They don't know that Texas is going to have four, uh, arguably five or six major metropolitan areas, uh, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, Dallas, Fort Worth, excuse me, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, Austin, El Paso. They don't know that. Uh, they think that, that in 1900, they, the thinking is basically there's going to be two great cities in Texas. One is going to be Galveston, and who knows what the other is. And that's a story for another lecture. But they do they, they wonder about this. Uh, but Galveston certainly is going to be the great city. And Galveston knows it will be, and uh, they've been assured that they will be. Now, one of the individuals who assures them is a, is a member of the the National Weather Bureau, which today is the National Weather Service, and uh, the official forecasting arm of the U.S. government. And, and the U.S. government had posted up a kind of an office at Galveston. It makes sense you're, that you're, one of your major ports is going to have a Weather Bureau office there. And the guy's name is Isaac Klein. 
Isaac Klein, K-L-I-N-E. He got there, if memory serves, about 1891-92. But as you would expect, uh, he would be a member of the community, and, or more particularly a prominent member of the community, and, a, and a, frankly, a, a successful, financially successful member of the community. And in the early 1890s, uh, maybe as late as 1895, Klein is going to write this paper on, really it's kind of a, I'll call it a Chamber of Commerce paper. And what I mean by that, kind of with a, a little bit of a, a sneer in my uh, voice, a Chamber of Commerce paper is, is that if you ever hear a press release from the Chamber of Commerce, the sun is always shining, uh, there's never a, a, a threatening cloud in the sky, literally or figuratively, economically, we're always just about to turn the corner, or it's as good as it can be, or you need to move here right now and invest and build and spend money with us. Come visit us, whatever it is. But the Chamber of Commerce is rarely going to say things are hard. And if they do say that, they normally also would say, People need to give us money. Okay, let's see. Hopefully that didn't hiccup. I don't think it did. But the fact of the matter is, is that, uh, but what it boils out to, uh, come now. All right, so Galveston uh, was assured by Klein, the National Weather Bureau uh, chieftain. Uh, he was assured by, uh, they were assured by Klein that Galveston, because of its proximity on the Texas coast, could not have a hurricane hit it. Uh, it was not going to happen. Uh, if you know your geography of Texas, and probably at this point in time as you're watching this, maybe just pull up a picture if you're not that good with geography. Uh, pull up a picture of the, the state of Texas, uh, look at it on a map, and find Galveston, which is southeast of Houston. So what you would do is uh, you, would, you would say, what Klein was saying basically, and there is some truth and validity to what he was saying, is this, that most hurricanes miss the Texas coast. And if you actually watch it, there is truth in the sense that most hurricanes curve upward, meaning northward, and plow into Louisiana. Louisiana gets a lot of hurricanes. A lot of them bend back and hit into Florida, partially because it's a peninsula, partially because of the prevailing winds, all true. Uh, and then there's a lot of hurricanes that go, uh, if they go westward, they go into deep south Texas or frankly more into Mexico. Mexico, the, the Gulf Coast of Mexico, over its over a decade gets a lot of uh, mostly mid-sized hurricanes, sometimes big, but they get a lot of hurricanes too. Uh, so there is some truth to the idea that there's a gap in the in hurricanes in Texas, and the Texas coast is protected. Uh, but even in 19, 1895, when this white paper is going to be written, uh, Klein should have been more honest and less uh, confident, uh, but confidence is uh, oftentimes uh, the downfall of many a man. But he should have been more co uh, confident and, or excuse me, more reasonable to say, you know what, there have been hurricanes that have hit the Texas coast. Shoot, there have been hurricanes that had hit it recently to, compared to him. Uh, if he wrote the, the white paper in 1895, it may have been 93, he all he had to do was look back in the last two decades to find two hurricanes that smashed Indianola. And Galveston was where, well aware of it, and there was some talk in Galveston of helping out hit Indianola and helping Indianola rebuild. Talk about those hurricanes in a second, but Galveston forgot it and moved on with life. But anyways, uh, Klein basically said, we're safe, don't worry about it, you're fine. Obviously, that was not true, uh, and we know that uh, on many levels now. And, but we have to be, I, I, you know, I can criticize him, and I just did criticize uh, a historical character. I think you have to be a little restrained, though, and this is uh, me as I get a little older, I say this uh, a little more, uh, because you got to remember that for, all, for what people in the past thought they knew, there was a whole lot that they don't know. And for what the same will be said about us, whether to our face or by our, or by our descendants, they thought they knew a whole lot, but they were actually quite ignorant of this and that. Or some people might say less kindly, why did they do what they did? So uh, all that to say is that the problem Galveston has is it is vulnerable to a hurricane in 1900, just like it is in 2020. But the difference between 2020 and 1900 is, is that at least in 2020, Galveston has been built up and it has a pretty uh, impressive seawall, plus uh, all the, uh, the, the, the developments of modern uh, technology that allow you to know where a hurricane is and coming and going and all that sort of stuff or at least have a good idea of it, and you can see it out in the Gulf. They didn't have any of that back then. They had, uh, they had stations and relay stations and telegraphs, but they didn't have any radar or anything of that nature, so they, they knew a hurricane was out in the Gulf, but where's it going to go? Uh, 
Some thought to New Orleans and Louisiana. Thought, some thought to Mexico. Heck, some people thought it was in Florida. Uh, but it was churning in the first weekend of September, September 6th through the 8th, as I recall, uh, to Galveston. The problem with Galveston also in 19, 1900 versus 2020 is its geography or its uh, actual geology. In 2020, I say it like this, is that the highest point of Galveston in 1900 was uh, four feet above sea level. And to my recollection today, Galveston today is 20 foot above sea level because Galveston pumped a whole lot of sand into, onto the island after the hurricane. But in 1900, it was much, much lower. Four foot above sea level, no seawall, and you have a hurricane that's going to push about, uh, eh, about eight, between 15 and 18 feet of water onto the island. The hurricane itself comes ashore probably just a little bit south and west of Galveston in 1900, uh, say closer to the mouth of the Brazos River, just somewhere around Freeport or Velasco as it used to be known as. Maybe a little bit north of there, but uh, Brazoria County nonetheless. Now, that hurricane came ashore. It was not as powerful as sometimes you think, but it was a strong enough hurricane, big enough, and it shoved a whole bunch of water onto Galveston. And what it does is it catches people in the nighttime, um, there was indications a hurricane was coming because you saw you were observing things and on Saturday morning, uh, late Friday, Saturday morning that had not been observed in a long time. The bay, the wind was blowing hard out of the northeast. The, the waters of the bay were going out. Uh, it was just obvious something big was up. But a lot of folks thought it was not a big deal. They, uh, you know, they've gone through squalls before. But what is going to make uh, the hurricane of 1900 so grisly and so bad was, of course, all that water. Uh, a lot of houses will be uh, destroyed because they will be flooded out. Uh, the wind was high enough to destroy lesser-made houses. Some of these houses weren't made, built all that well. It is not true to say that everything that was built 100 years ago was built better than it is in 2020. Some were, some weren't. Uh, but the lesser quality houses, they were destroyed. And so you have all this driftwood and all this debris floating in the water as the water comes in. And spectacularly, at one moment in the nighttime, uh, those who saw it said that the water rose like five foot over in just a span of a few seconds. Drowned thousands of people. Drowned thousands of people. Uh, but in addition to that, the Galveston hurricane of 1900 also, because the wind uh, was high enough, uh, it was in excess of 110, 115 miles an hour, uh, a lot of those roofs back then were made of slate tile and, and similar type substances. So what it was is this tile is going to be peeled off the rooftops. And what it ends up doing is, is that it peels off the, ro the roof and it starts, the hurricane starts throwing these tiles as if they were darts or arrows. But with sinister effect, and people would say who survived and said, I was talking to somebody and all of a sudden I heard this thud. And they were dead. They didn't talk anymore because it's in the middle of the night, these slate tiles would hit them in the face or hit them in the chest and it would impale. The wind was high enough and it'd kill them. Uh, so people get drugged down and drowned by the water and the debris. Uh, it, it, was, it was horrible in that sense, the uh, slate tile. Um, in addition, one of the more uh, tragic and, uh, and, and heart-rending stories out of the Galveston hurricane in 1900 was this uh, Catholic orphanage there on the, on the bay, on the water. It's not on the bay, it's on the gulf, actually. Uh, but it was about a three- or four-story orphanage. Uh, had about 120 orphans in there and about a half a dozen, maybe closer to a dozen uh, nuns. Uh, and, and they're facing the gulf. And the water's coming in, and as the water rises, they keep going up, up, and up. But eventually, they run out of, uh, of space. But one of the, in in the in a panicky moment, and I, I don't fault them for this, other than you wish they had not done this, of course. But in a panicky moment, what do we do to save the children? Uh, one of the nuns came up with the idea: let's tie ourselves to the nuns, and we'll all uh, stick together. The problem was, it was like a string or a fish. And so if one kid got caught by the debris as the orphanage uh, collapsed upon them, they were all caught by it. And so a few days after the fact, as the waters are receding and, and the debris is everywhere, somebody walking along the beach there where the old orphanage used to be grabbed a hold of a, of a rope, just, you know, one of those things you see it and you pull it sort of deal. I've done it a handful of times in my life. In the sense, you just see a rope and pull it, see what comes up. Well, up came a hand. And then they found the rest of the kids. Like I said, there was a, a memory serves like one nun and about two children survived. It was a it was a horrible affair. So Isaac Klein, who had one of the best built houses in Galveston, uh, 
his house survived. Excuse me, no, it did not. It did not survive. It was destroyed by a railroad truss that got flung and hit it. It was it was a mess. It was a mess. His family was essentially, he, Klein survived it. His wife and uh, children died in it. Um, when the uh, sun rose on Sunday morning, because the hurricane had gone inland, and it was clear in Galveston, the, the, the gulf was as beautiful and blissful as you could imagine. But Galveston was wrecked. It was never the same again. Uh, men, black men particularly, but also white men and Hispanic men as well, uh, will be pressed into to, to burial details. Sometimes they're pressed into burial details at gunpoint. Other times uh, by persuasion, a promise of pay and liquor. Uh, you got to clean up the bodies. You got to pick up the, the dead. And so at first what they did was they started to pick these bodies up and they put them on barges as, uh, and it was uh, grisly sights. And so they started loading these, uh, these dead Galvestonians up on barges and they took them out into the Gulf of Mexico and they threw them into the ocean. A few days later, they started to wash back up on shore. And so for the next six weeks, maybe closer to two months at Galveston, as they cleaned up the mess at Galveston, and you can see pictures of the wreckage of Galveston on, online. It's pretty easy to get your hands on. The fact is is that you, uh, they said everybody who was at Galveston, whether they're in the relief and recovery efforts or because they were survivors, they smelt the awful smell of burning flesh because you couldn't dump them in the ocean and you had the rotting flesh as well. So they started throwing these uh, bodies up onto, on the, onto pyres, P-Y-R-E-S. Uh, these funeral pyres were lit with the uh, debris of these old houses and, and buildings and structures and such. Uh, and so you had fur burning funeral pyres all over Galveston for the next six weeks. Um, Galveston was never the same again. Uh, they will spend treasure, tons of treasure to protect Galveston to build a seawall and, and it had helped. About 10, 15 years later, about 15 years later, another hurricane passed through Galveston, uh, and that hurricane was stronger actually than 1900, but it didn't do near the damage uh, that 1900 did. But in the process, though, Houston, which had been looking for years uh, to take advantage of Galveston, to get past Galveston and become the great city it was destined to become in the sense, Houston stuck its hand up and said to the federal government, oh, by the way, you can't have a deep sea port that can get wrecked and destroyed by a hurricane and call yourself a great city, a great country. And so what Houston did, which had some, its own political influences in the U.S. government, was able to get the federal government to dig out the Houston Ship Channel. Maybe if you're from Deer Park or down there at Stinkadena, a.k.a. Pasadena, Baytown, and you say, I know that territory. I, have, I lived on the, the port of Houston. Well, that port of Houston was born out of the wreckage of Galveston in the sense that Houston took advantage of Galveston's uh, hurt. Galveston was never the same again. Houston, uh, with the oil industry refining, which we'll get into more in another lecture, that became the great city of Texas. And Galveston was really effectively relegated to the past. So hurricanes and weather can really change the trajectory of history. You, you, people talk about being on the right side of history or knowing the, the arc of history like it's some sort of preordained thing, which is, a, is not true, frankly. You never know what can uh, come up and change uh, what you thought was uh, the future. The other city that was affected by a hurricane and uh, took advantage of it versus being... Uh, relegated to a, a secondary status is Corpus Christi. In 1919, and this is a much shorter story, 1919, Corpus Christi is a sm smallish community, about 5,000 individuals. Uh, it is uh, comparable in size to its neighbors of Aransas Pass and Rockport. And uh, there was thinking, and there was legitimate thinking, that there's going to be another great deep sea port in Texas, uh, along with Galveston, or excuse me, at that point, Houston, and it's going to be down on the coast somewhere. Well, everybody wants the federal government through the Army Corps of Engineers to dig out uh, your port, because if you get a deep sea port, you're a city. You're going to be somebody, and you're going to make a lot of money if you know, if you got good investments and in banking and all that sort of thing. And in September, maybe in late August, I need to check the date, I guess, but I think it was September, late uh, 1919, a sizable hurricane smacked Corpus Christi, flooded Rockport, flooded Aransas Pass, but really damaged Corpus, uh, Corpus Christi. Uh, 
But the hurricane of 1919, which killed a bunch of people, hundreds of people in Corpus, uh, had the effect of driving the factions, and there was Corpus Christi has been factionally political, uh, factionalized politically for years, had the effect of driving the factions uh, of Corpus Christi together and making them work together. And so what Corpus did in 1919 wasn't uh, to build a seawall immediately. They didn't do what Galveston did, which was we have got to protect ourselves now. Uh, the, the horse is out of the barn, but we got to make sure there's not another 1919. What Corpus ended up doing was they basically decided, well, we're not going to go that route. We're going to use this as an opportunity to remake the city of Corpus Christi into what we want it to be. And so they started the preparations and started the lobbying, and they, got, they were successful, and they got the Port of Corpus Christi dug out and trenched out. Uh, depends on the year, but basically the Port of Corpus Christi is somewhere around the eighth busiest port in America and the United States. Uh, if you've been down that way, of course, maybe you went to a, a baseball game when you could do these sorts of things and went to Waterburger Field. Uh, you would, it's kind of beautiful. I, like, I love baseball. Uh, but you see those big ships coming in under the Bay Bridge, and then you look and you see all the refineries and, and this and that set up. Uh, that's, uh, that is a direct dis, uh, result over the years, uh, the long sweep of time looking back now. That's a direct result of what Corpus chose to do in the face of a hurricane in 19, uh, of a hurricane, in this case, 1919. Lastly, uh, in talking about a cities that are no more in Texas history with regard to fierce storms that uh, do a lot of damage, uh, the example of Indianola is uh, where we draw to a close today. Uh, Indianola in 1875 and in 1886 is going to be hit by two powerful hurricanes. Indianola in the, mid, the middle part of the latter quarter, uh, excuse me, the third quarter of the 19th century, Indianola, which sits uh, about 70, 60, 70 miles up the coast from Corpus Christi uh, and about 120 miles or 100 miles down the coast from Galveston, Indianola was a, a departure point and a, a, a drop-off point for a whole lot of immigrants. Maybe some of you, if you've been in Texas for a long time, your family didn't go to go ashore at Galveston like mine did. Uh, your family went ashore at Indianola. Lots of boats, uh, a good amount of traffic. A lot of speculation was that would be the second uh, port city of Texas was Indianola. But in 19, uh, eight, excuse me, 1876 and 18, excuse me, 1875 and 1886, Indianola is uh, going to be wrecked and then finally destroyed and never rebuilt by two hurricanes. Uh, a lot of people get killed. I mean, it's just wiped off the map. And so you talk about the change of history where you thought you had a future to there is no future here. Uh, unless there's a few people who have built uh, some stuff around Indianola today, uh, to my knowledge, all that's left of Indianola is just a, a historical marker of the town. Maybe a few old uh, leftover block buildings, but uh, hurricanes have uh, impacted Texas quite a bit. So we continue in the next lecture about uh, weather in Texas. Uh, we talk about uh, uh, tornadoes and such, and then we move into uh, geography about uh, rivers and such, maybe some disasters and such as well. So anyways, that's a good place to stop, and we'll continue in the next uh, go-around.